Hi everyone, my name is Brandon Schlinker and I'm a research scientist here in the Traffic Infrastructure Group at Meta. Today, along with my colleague Sharad Jaswal, we're gonna be talking about network SLOs and how they enable us here at Meta to know when the network is the barrier to quality of experience. So I wanna start off talking about network SLOs by talking about a concept that's familiar to all of us, and that's the idea of system requirements. We oftentimes see this on software, it's gonna tell you it needs some processor, RAM, hard disk space in order for that software to operate well. But today, everything that we do is often online. And so that means you really care about the network between your device and the service or content provider. So for instance, if I'm using Instagram on my phone, the network conditions between myself and Meta's edge really matter in terms of determining whether or not I'm going to have a good quality of experience. Yet as an industry, we still have a limited understanding of network requirements and how to define them for these types of products. And that presents both an opportunity and a challenge. And that's because understanding a product's network requirements could help us in multiple ways. We could use it to goal and improve a product's network efficiency, characterize its total addressable market, triage regressions and quality of experience and understand if they're due to the network and characterize Meta's network resiliency. Now at Meta, product teams come to focus on my team for help with all of these problems. And I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into this triaging regressions and quality of experience. So we're gonna start off at the product level and product teams throughout the company are continuously monitoring quality of experience perceived by users. So in this case, we have a regression occurring and I'm not gonna go into the details of what QOE is here right now, but that could mean worse image quality or perhaps an increase in video stalls. Now the product team is gonna use the metrics that they understand best to try and debug this problem. And that means application layer metrics. So for instance, they may see, well, it's taking longer for us to fetch these video objects. It must be the network. But unfortunately, they frequently, frequently arrive at erroneous conclusions. For instance, a change in multiplexing behavior or how the CDN caching layer is behaving could also cause those same problems. So at the end of the day, this all ultimately arrives at our team. And we need a way to be able to really quickly evaluate what's going on. Is it due to those network conditions? And that's challenging because we know there's a long list of components in the path that can affect quality of experience. You have application logic, like the ABR algorithm, deciding which bit rate of video to play. Are we gonna play HD or SD? You have the network stack, where we're deciding which of our pops to send the user to. You have our custom quick transport. You also have the edge to user network, the components that are edge pop, like the load balancers, the cache. Some of these requests might traverse our backbone, in which case they might traverse even more load balancers, a different cache and the origin service. Any one of the components in that path can ultimately affect quality of experience and could be responsible for the regression we saw earlier. Now we know from experience that the edge to user network is often the culprit, but we need concrete evidence to say that. And so that's where I get back to our, my original point here, that we need to be able to understand our product's network requirements. And that's where network SLOs come in. Network SLOs define the edge to user network conditions that are required for good quality of experience. And they enable us to make very powerful statements. For instance, if network conditions are non-compliant according to network SLOs, meaning that the network isn't meeting those conditions, then we know definitively that quality of experience is being impaired by network conditions. Likewise, if the network conditions are compliant, then we can definitively state that quality of experience for that product is not being impaired by the network. So now that I've introduced the concept of network SLOs and their value, I'm gonna go through how we characterize quality of experience and network conditions. Then Sherrod is gonna dive into how we derive and operationalize network SLOs. So measuring quality of experience is often application specific. And I wanna start off with an example using video on demand. So video on demand is any video that a user uploads to Facebook or Instagram, and then you watch at any point in time. We look at three things when we're evaluating whether or not a user had good quality of experience for a VOD session. First, the video must start playing within one second. And the reason for that should be obvious. We want the service to be interactive and responsive. 
Second, the video shouldn't stall. Clearly, that's going to be disruptive to the user's experience. And third, we want the video to be of high quality. And that's in part to guard against and ensure we're not serving low quality video just to meet these first two criteria. Application startup is another example. And generally speaking, if you load one of our applications, such as Instagram, we want that application to start and be ready and all the components in your feed to be loaded within 500 milliseconds. And that's hard because there's a lot of different components that play a role here, including prefetch, caching, ABR, network conditions, and how the application uses the network. So now that we've walked through what characterizing quality of experience means, let's talk about the other piece of the puzzle, which is characterizing network conditions. And we need to keep two things in mind. First, in order to derive network SLOs, we need joint measurement of network conditions and quality of experience. And so for instance, that means we need to measure during application startup, first, how long it took for it to start. Was it 500 milliseconds and less or more? And we also need to know for that same startup interaction that we measured, what the network conditions were. Now, in order to track network SLO compliance, we need to be able to measure those same network conditions in the wild because we want to measure the network conditions and then infer whether or not quality of experience is being impaired by the network. So with those high-level thoughts in mind, we can distill this down to four key goals. Our approach to characterizing network conditions must work in the wild because we need to continuously measure network conditions to measure compliance. It has to have little overhead because we don't want to use up our bat user's battery life or require additional data. It needs to measure the network, not the CDN or the app, because we don't want to have the confounding factors that I brought up earlier, like HTTP multiplexing or problems at the CDN, causing us to erroneously conclude the network's the problem. And it needs to yield representative measurements. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more in detail later, but generally speaking, our products are sensitive to network conditions at short timescales because we have those very short, tight deadlines for QoE. So when people think about characterizing the network, the first thing they oftentimes think of is a speed test. Clearly that works in the wild, and yes, it measures the network. But the problem is it has a lot of overhead. We can't run that in the background. It's gonna disrupt our users, and it would use up data plans allocations that they might have. In addition, it's not gonna be representative, and that's because a speed test measures over a long period of time, an average or a maximum rate. Well, what we're interested in is knowing the network's ability to provide small amounts of data at short time intervals. People also commonly think of controlled experiments where I might set up a server, a client, and a network in between, and I can control that network however I want. But that's not good enough because even though in that scenario we can control the network, we still have to be able to measure the network in the wild. Retransmission rate is another component people think of or other similar transport metrics. And while I don't have time to dive into this in detail, the problem with these types of metrics is that they are ultimately a function of how the application behaves. If the application makes more aggressive use of network resources, you have a higher probability of retransmissions due to a higher prob probability of self-induced congestion. So our solution to all of this is what we call synthetic blocks, and it checks all of these boxes. And the key insight in synthetic blocks is that we're gonna passively measure how long it takes the network to deliver a fixed amount of data. And the reason this is the right thing for us to measure is because for Meta's applications, quality of experience is in part a function of the network's ability to deliver bytes in a timely manner. And that really comes down to a small amount of bytes in a small amount of time. So the first step in synthetic blocks is defining the representative block size. And what we wanna be able to do here is we wanna be able to measure something, measure in a way that we are sensitive to the variations in network conditions that matter. So for instance, this figure on the left shows throughput and how it varies over time. A speed test would average over 15 seconds and might tell me 10 megabits per second, but shorter transfers may see very different rates. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to define sizes of blocks or amounts of data that we want to measure, how long it takes for the network to transfer. A smaller block, such as a 50 kilobyte block, has a shorter average transfer time, and that means it's more sensitive to variations in network conditions. Conversely, a larger block, such as a 200 kilobyte block, has a larger, longer average transfer time, 
and it's less sensitive to variations. So the block size determines how sensitive the transfer is to network variations. So now that we've defined 50 and 200 kilobyte block sizes, and we understand how each is sensitive to different variations, let's talk about how we're going to measure those blocks passively. On the left-hand side, we have what are applications written to the network. And there's an image, the network became idle, and then the application was fetching from the server 102 kilobytes of image and a 357 kilobyte video. Now, clearly the challenge is those object sizes and all those sizes in general are not aligned with the 50 or 200 kilobyte blocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the transport layer. We don't care about the HTTP level context. And we're going to look at, OK, now we have 82 and 469 kilobyte blocks. Then we're going to transform those blocks into 50 kilobyte synthetic blocks. And for that larger transfer at the end, the 469 kilobyte transfer, we can transform it into two 200 kilobyte synthetic blocks. So now we have all these small measurements in the intervals that we've defined. Then we measure how long it takes for the network to transfer each of these blocks. And that ultimately comes down to when did we send it and then when did we get the act for it. And the delta tells us the transfer time for each of those blocks. And finally, we account for congestion control and transport behavior. And while I unfortunately don't have time to go into this in detail, we account for a number of things, including slow start, delayed acts, self-induced congestion, bandwidth probing, and propagation delay, ultimately allowing us to ensure that these measurements are representative of what would happen if we transferred these 50 and 200 kilobyte files. Finally, from those measurements, we derive a probability distribution of transfer time per block size. So for instance, we can say 70% of the time, the network can deliver 50 kilobytes of data in 40 milliseconds or less. And we can do the same from our 200 kilobyte block size, which will have a different probability distribution because it's less sensitive to variations in network conditions. Now that I've gone over how we characterize quality of experience in the network, I'm going to hand it over to Sharad, who's going to talk about how we derive network SLOs. Thanks, Brandon. So Brandon laid the groundwork motivating network SLOs and what are the requirements on the network metrics and the methodology to link application behavior with network conditions. Let's now get into the details of deriving network SLOs. As he mentioned, a key step towards deriving network SLOs is to gather the network quality of service samples, namely the transfer times of synthetic blocks jointly with the quality of experience signals for the same user sessions. Now, this ensures that we know the precise network conditions associated with any change in quality of experience. Hence, it's essential we do them, we co collect them together. While we are able to associate the network quality of service samples with the QoE metric, we still have the question, what is the size of synthetic blocks over which we compute transfer time quality of service? As Brandon mentioned earlier, this is dependent on the application sensitivity to the time scale at which network conditions vary. Since we do not know this in advance, we evaluate different versions of metrics. For example, the medium transfer time over 50 kilobyte blocks versus 200 kilobyte blocks. And, and then we evaluate their metrics based on the efficacy to predict application quality of experience. How do we do this? We do this by treating a particular value associated with a metric as a threshold for a binary classifier. If that threshold value is exceeded, then the application QoE is predicted to be bad. We do a parameter sweep over all such thresholds for all candidate metrics. Then we evaluate the quality of the metric by comparing the true versus false positive rates for all thresholds. And the metric which gives us the best trade-off as captured by the area under the curve as seen here, wins. So now we have a winning quality of service metric in its ability to predict QoE. And if we plot the distributions of the quality of service metric over the application QoE bad session rate, if we, if we plot these two together, then we can use this to determine what the minimum QoS metric value that the application needs from the network. So let's look at this graph here. To the right is increasing transfer times. And as we can expect, this is correlated with higher bad session rates, as can be expected when the network conditions become terrible or worse. For example, in the case of a very slow wireless network. 
And the batch session rate actually improves with improving network conditions, which corresponds to lower transfer times. At some point, we discover the knee in the curve, i.e. when the batch session rate is no longer dependent on the network, but could be impacted by other things, for example, the CDN cache times and so forth. This is the point that, 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 that marks the minimum level of service that an application needs for the network. And this, is, this, this threshold is what we call the service level indicator or the SLI threshold. The SLI threshold tells us what the application needs for the network. But how do we evaluate whether the network is actually able to meet this? Well, to answer this, first we must define what we mean by a network in this context. An intuitive criteria would be an entire ISP. But an ISP can be made up of users and different access technologies, geographical locations, all of which could have very different network characteristics. Hence, mixing them all together may not lead to useful, actionable insights. So we have developed a novel approach to clustering clients that we call network aggregates. Specifically, we use active measurements to, to localize clients by their geographical proximity and by their access technology. And a network aggregate basically maps such clients with homogeneous access technologies and similar geographical locations into one tuple. And this tuple is what we call a network aggregate. And this forms the granularity at which we evaluate network clients, network SLO compliance. The other aspect of evaluating compliance is, is the time interval. And we currently do this over 15 minutes. This corresponds to the time scale of network events that matter from an operational perspective. Now, when we have to evaluate compliance, we have to be mindful of one more thing. Uh, we should be robust to outlier events or users. For example, consider a network aggregate that's made up of customers of a fiber ISP in the Bay Area, which should normally be expected to have excellent network conditions. Now, it's possible to have a single user with a spotty Wi-Fi signal to the gateway router, or a couple of users with a spotty Wi-Fi signal to the gateway router. Clearly, these few outlier signals are not representative of the network performance of the aggregate as a whole. So to capture this, we set a threshold on the percentage of network samples within an aggregate that should be compliant to the SLI threshold. This threshold, referred as a network service level objective to meet the SLI, is selected to optimize detecting actual regressions in the target batch session rate for the aggregate while minimizing operational false alarms. So given that we have an ability to answer whether the network aggregate is SLO compliant or not, and hence whether it's a barrier to application performance in a given time interval, let's see how we can use this signal, this powerful signal, to, to actually make networks better. So the SLO compliance signal over a network aggregate is a binary up or down signal. However, operationally, we need to capture the state of network readiness often at the granularity of an ISP or a country or a geographical region. So to do this, we actually convert the binary up down signal to the percentage of egress in, a, in an ISP or a country that's in SLO compliant network aggregates. And, and tracking compliance at this level helps us drive initiatives on network edge peering investments across the aggregation level that we care about. If you actually track the temporal patterns of how the percentage of egress that's compliant varies over time, we can actually get interesting actionable insights. For example, a network that is found to be non-compliant for persistently across most hours of the day is slightly limited by the access technology of the network operator or by the traffic engineering policies. But a network that becomes non-compliant either only during some busy hours or sporadically is, is probably needs or can be made better by some direct network planning and investments. Now, these insights lead to very different conversations with our ISV partners. As it turns out, the vast majority of SLO compliance is due to limitations of the network downstream from Meta's edge infrastructure. It's not directly influenced by Meta. 
But Meta's edge capacity can also influence SLO compliance of its end users. Let's consider an example. Let's consider an end user which is currently connected to a POP A or an edge location A. And let's assume either because the edge POP became overloaded or there were some issues inside the infrastructure, the user was redirected to an alternate POP B. When traffic is shifted to this new POP, the edge user network has changed. And by tracking whether the percentage of egress that stays compliant to the network aggregates that are served by these POPs has changed or not, we can answer whether this movement of traffic affected the user quality of experience. If it did, then it, this actually surfaces a gap in Meta's edge, edge, edge capacity. Because ideally, we, the, that, that particular optimal edge location should have been able to handle the extra load without having to move users to a, to a, to a, to a location where it affects the quality of experience. And conversely, if it does not, then it also gives a good signal that, that the Meta's edge, capa edge infrastructure has sufficient redundancy to be handled to be able to handle these overload events. And we are good for now. So with that example, I, I have hopefully walked through you through over how we derive network SLOs in practice and how we put them to use in Meta's edge network capacity decisions. And with that, I'd like to hand you back to my colleague, Brandon, for a recap of this talk. Thanks. Thanks, Sharad. So to recap, Network SLOs define the edge to user network conditions that are required for good quality of experience. And they enable us to make two very powerful statements. First, if network conditions are non-compliant for a product according to our network SLOs, then we know that quality of experience for that product is being impaired by the network. Conversely, if network conditions are compliant, then we can definitively state that quality of experience is not being impaired by the network. And at Meta, Network SLOs help us in many ways. While I focused on how we use them to triage regressions and quality of experience, and Sharad focused on how we use them to characterize network resiliency, we also use them to improve product network efficiency by setting goals around what the network, what our product's network requirements are. Likewise, we use them to characterize total addressable market for current and future products. And with that, I appreciate everyone's attention during this talk and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you.